firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Hopefully you're ca- sensing, oh, we're going to play it again. Just make sure you get that. Hopefully you're sensing a theme here, all things hold together in Christ. That's the, the title of our series on Colossians, All Things. It's the heart of the passage we're memorizing as a church, that he is before all things. And you heard it in the song, you heard it in that little video, and that's what we're focusing on. If you missed last week, by the way, uh, we took a little break from our Colossians series. Let me encourage you. You can go on the church app if you have it or on your YouTube channel and listen to Gary Haugen from the International Justice Mission, his message to us. Such an important message. It's still rattling around in my mind and soul. And if you missed it, I encourage you to go catch up and hear that. We took a break from Colossians. Now we're back into Colossians. And this book is really, really amazing. Um, as some of you have remarked, there's less of me these days. And uh, if you don't know what that means, I have been in the last several, eight, eight or nine months or so, uh, trying to make it a concerted effort to lose weight and get healthier. I don't want this to be about me, but I've noticed something in this process. Some of you, the people who come up to me are in two camps. They either say, what'd you do? Or they say, you know what you should do. They, wanna, they, they either want to know the secret or they want to tell me the secret. They want to ask me, what'd you do? Did you do keto? Did you do paleo? Did you do no low carb, high carb, no carb? What'd you do? Did you do CrossFit? Did you do Orange Theory? What are you doing? You know? Or they say, now that you're doing it, you know what you should do. And they tell me what they're doing. And maybe you can relate. You know what you do ne- need now is hot yoga, essential oils. <laughs> no, I don't. He does. <laughs> but some people want to know what the secret is. Would you like to know the secret? I'll tell you. Would you like to know? I'll tell you. It's two things eat way less garbage, and move way more. I'm not joking. Most people say what you do, they mean what'd you, how'd you get yourself to do it. We all know what to do. In life, in fitness, in business, and in matters of faith, everybody's looking for the secret, the thing, the trick. What do you do? And often it's a lot simpler than we think it is. It's just getting ourselves to face it, to do it. And in this series in Colossians, we're looking at the Apostle Paul has been focusing on who Jesus is and how everything holds together in him, how he's it. He's the thing. He's the secret. He's the preeminent one, the firstborn of all creation, the image of the invisible God. Everything holds in him. And for many of us, we're saying, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like Jesus, but I need something more, something else. Paul's saying you don't, actually. And he wrote this letter to these Christians, this, this church, a group of believers living in the ancient city of Colossae. It's in, it's in modern-day southeastern Turkey today. And this is a kind of a nothing town. Wasn't that important economically or politically or culturally? Paul had never been there. He'd heard about their faith through a man named Epaphras who probably planted that church and was most likely led to faith by Paul. He's never been there. He's heard about their faith. He writes them a letter. And above all the things he wants to say to them is, is primarily is, Stay focused on Jesus. Because they are being bombarded with messages in their culture, like we are in ours, with there's other things you need. There's other things you should be doing. There's more. So if you have your Bible, we're going to jump into Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through, we'll read just verses 2 through, through chapter 2, verse 5 to start. We got almost half a chapter here to go through this morning, and it was, I don't know what I was thinking. We're never going to get this in, so st- strap in. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> like, no, I'm not. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. 
For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ." That's still not even a third of what we're going to talk about. And it's just loaded with profound images and, and important wisdom for our lives. Notice some of the words and phrases Paul uses. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings. I have a great struggle. I toil and labor. He uses struggle, suffering, toil, and great labor. What's he talking about? What is all this suffering and struggling and toiling for? Well, in verse 28, he tells us that you may be presented mature in Christ. You want to boil it down? What's Paul's agony and suffering and labor and effort for? It's for the church, the Colossian church and the church in, uh, in the world, to be mature in Christ. We said at the outset of the series that Paul's heart for the Colossians is really God's heart for us, his church in the world. What's his heart for you? To grow up in Jesus. To become spiritually mature. Well, how does that happen then? What's the secret to becoming spiritually mature? This is Paul's goal and his mission, but how does it happen? And there were some competing ideas and notions in the first century, as there are in the 21st century, about how you grow spiritually. Paul says the key is really quite simple. Spiritual maturity is found in one simple two-word phrase, which is all over Colossians, all over the New Testament, it's all over Paul's writings, in him. Spiritual growth and spiritual maturity has everything to do with what it means to be in Christ, to be in him. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What does that mean, being in him? Paul says, do you notice how he starts? I rejoice in my sufferings. Does that sound odd to you? Rejoicing in sufferings? I mean, I could understand, you know, tolerating your sufferings, persevering through your sufferings, enduring your sufferings, gritting your teeth and pushing through, you know. Stay calm and carry on through your sufferings. But he says, I rejoice in them. How do you rejoice in sufferings? That doesn't even sound desirable, let alone possible. The key, again, is this phrase, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, when Paul says that Christ is in you, what does he mean? Does he mean you or does he mean y'all? Is he saying you personally and me, like you individually, Christ is in you, or is he saying in you, the church, in y'all? Well, Paul was a Texan. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> he means both. He means both. He means both in you personally, when you trust in Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate here in being made new. That the Spirit of God comes into your heart and life, dwells within you. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. Think about that for a minute. Christ in you. We're memorizing this passage. He is the, invisible, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created. That's the one that's in you, in me, and in you. He's in you, if you're in him. And he's in us. In y'all, the church, he, we're called the body of Christ. He dwells in us. He's made known in the world through us. He is the hope of glory. Christ in you, in me, and in us. This, this is why rejoicing in our sufferings is possible because of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not possible without that. This idea was pressed, impressed on me last May while I was sitting at our oldest son's graduation commencement service at Wheaton College. Sitting there with all these parents, very emotional experience, some of you have been through that. The kind of the end of an era, culmination, and also the beginning, the threshold of, of, of adulthood, you know. New, uh, and I, just full of joy and pride and gratitude. And the speaker, uh, speaker as I should say, at, at, at Noah's commencement were two people, Andrew and Noreen Brunson. You'll see a picture of Andrew Brunson here. This is, uh, Pastor Brunson was a missionary in Turkey for 26 years, worked with refugees, church planting, and he worked predominantly on the Syrian border with Kurds, and he got caught up in a political mess and, and coup happening in Turkey and was accused falsely of being a, a, a terrorist on, in the guise of a pastor, in prison for over a year without any conviction, for a long time without any actual official charges, living in a cell that was designed for 15 men with 55 men for over a year. This is a picture of his release. And then here's a picture of he and his wife here speaking at uh, Noah's uh, graduation at Wheaton College. And they told their story. 
And I sat there and I listened to him, and he started this. So, you know, it's a, it's a room full, uh, full of parents, proud parents, and graduating seniors about to embark on their life. And he says, I hate to tell you this on your graduation day, but persecution and suffering is coming for you. Prepare yourselves, not for success, but for suffering. And he went on to say that what's needed, desperately needed in, in this generation right now is for young men and women to know what it means to stand with, for, and in Christ in their time. Now, that suffering might not take the form of a Turkish prison cell, probably won't for most of us. But there's no less desperate need for us to grow up in him, to understand what that means, to become spiritually mature. Let's read on. Verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Paul says, therefore, what's he referring back to? Not just this, this previous sentence or two, but all that he said up to this point, all that Christ is, all that Christ has done, because of him, walk in him. And he uses these two words, rooted and built up. Now notice he doesn't say walk with him, follow him, keep up with him. He says walk in him. There's that phrase. You're going to see it over and over again. In him. What does it mean to walk in him? Different than walking with him. When I was a kid, my grandfather, my dad's dad, was, he's a tall guy, a Scotsman, and I can remember vividly when I was a little guy walking, following him down the street in their retirement village in Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, and I, me- I have vivid memories of trying to match his strides. I would watch on the ground like where he put his foot and like how far, how past the crack in the sidewalk did grandpa's foot go, and I would try as a little boy to match that stride. And I was basically running to keep up with grandpa, and I couldn't do it. I'd fall further and further behind. Sometimes I think we, we think of following Jesus that way. Like, he's Jesus, and he's out there, and we're just trying to keep up like little kids, you know? You're not left alone in your own strength to try to live as Jesus lived. You couldn't do it. You probably already know that. You walk in him because he's in you, in his strength. He's in you, and you were to walk in him. And then he says, rooted and built up. Now, the ESV, which we're reading from, is a good translation, but I think there's something missing here. The New American Standard Bible puts it differently. It says, this, it puts it this way, having been rooted and being now built up. That's actually more accurate to what the Greek says. Because you've been rooted in him and are being built up. The rooted is, 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 is the past foundation you have in Christ. And the being built up is your present reality that he's doing something in you. And this gets at something that's profoundly important for our life as a Christ follower. Rooted as a sense of identity. How many people in our world today feel rootless? Feel adrift? I don't know where my place is. I don't know where I belong. I don't know wh- where I fit and who I am. And it's not just an e- issue for adolescents. I hear it from adults, some of you. Paul's saying you're rooted in him. He's your place. He's your identity. He's your belonging. That has happened. And when he talks about being built up, I think that's talking about purpose. That God's not done with you. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He's not done with you. So you have a place and an identity and a purpose, and God's not done with you. That's what Paul's saying here. And that's what enables you to walk in him. You're not just, hey, keep up with Jesus. Who could do that? But because you have an identity and a place and and roots in him and who he is, and because he's not done working in you, you're able to walk in him. This is what it means to, to, to grow up in maturity in Christ, to be in him. All right, let's read on, because we're not even half done. Are you excited? I am. Let's read verses 8 through 15. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And say it with me. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses 
by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Hopefully you're getting the theme by now. This is the very heart of Christianity, this passage. We could spend 10 sermons on this and it wouldn't come close. So I feel somewhat irresponsible trying to jam it into one. But here we go. If I ask you, what is the gospel? What comes into your mind? What do you think about? What's the gospel? Maybe some of you who have studied a little bit think good news, because that's what the word actually means, euangelion. It means glad tidings or good news. That's true. Maybe some of you think, well, it's, isn't that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels? That's also true. They're giving four different accounts of the life of Christ, which contains the good news. But if I said, could you boil it down to a sentence or two on what's the heart of the Christian message, the gospel? What is this all about? It's hard, isn't it? Where do you start? Do you start in Genesis? Do you start in Matthew? Do you start in John? Where do, how do you? Paul's giving us that here. The very essence, core, heart of the Christian gospel, the good news. And I want to walk you through it. First, he says, you were dead. The Greek word for dead is nekros there. Do you know what it means in Greek? Dead. <laughs> it means dead. Not mostly dead, as in the princess bride, because that's slightly alive. It means all dead, all the way dead, dead, dead. You were dead in your trespass. Now, you laugh at that, and it's, I'm trying to be funny a little bit, but think about this for a minute. Spiritually speaking, it means dead, powerless. Most of us don't think of our life that way. We think of Jesus as a great spiritual life coach, as a therapist, as an add-on. Yes, I'm not perfect. I've got plenty of issues. Just ask my wife, but, you know, I want Jesus to help clean up my act. I've said this many times, talked to a guy years ago who said, you know, I could use a little Jesus in my life. Well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus. And you're dead. No life coach is going to help you. No, how, can you imagine a therapist helping a corpse? Why don't you tell him about your issues? Right? <laughs> you're dead. You can do nothing about your condition. And he says you're dead in your sin and trespasses, meaning because of our sinfulness, and it's not just a collection of wrongdoings. It's in us like a, like a computer virus. We can't help it. We are sin if, to our core, and we're dead in our sin. This is not a popular message today, but it's at the heart of the Christian gospel. And if we left it there, that wouldn't be very good news. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Go in peace. Right? <laughs> no, Romans 3.24. And are justified freely by his grace. Then Paul says next, what does he say? God made you alive. I want to put verses, right? God made alive together with him. You who were dead, all the way dead, powerless. And John Stott puts it this way. He says, to be spiritually dead means you might, there's a lot of people walking around in our culture today. They look very alive. They, they're they're phys financially wealthy, physically fit, and they look alive. But spiritually speaking, they're dead. Paul says in Ephesians, they're without hope, without God in the world. John Stott puts it this way. He says, blind to the glory of Christ, deaf to the voice of the Holy Spirit, unaware of the presence of God, as unresponsive to Jesus as a corpse. And God makes you alive. God made you alive. He doesn't clean up your act, doesn't help you improve yourself. He makes you alive. He brings you to life. This is the heart of the Christian message. Dead things, dead people come to life. That's the symbol of baptism. Buried with Christ in baptism, under the water, dead. Risen with him to new life. Jesus doesn't improve your life. He's not an additive to your life. He is your life, Paul will say in Colossians 3. We're going to get to that in a couple of weeks, right? He who is your life. This is the great mystery and power of the gospel. Does this thrill you? I know that you sit in church crowded and stare forward until I say amen and then you go home. Does this thrill your heart? Does it thrill you at all to, that you, to think about the fact that God has made you alive? You don't look very thrilled. Does it thrill you? Somebody say, I know this is, come on. Right? I know you, know you need permission. You don't need my permission to say amen to the fact that God made you alive with Christ. It gives me chills to think about that. I'm spiritually dead. And God made me alive. I couldn't do anything about it. Neither could you. But he did that. Okay, how did he do it? The, Paul goes on, by forgiving our trespasses and canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Think about those phrases. 
forgiven you and canceling what stood against you, your record of debt. Your sin is a record of debt against you and against me. It's a debt you cannot pay. It's crushing debt, debt that you could never pay off, not in a thousand infinite lifetimes. You're not capable. What if you woke up tomorrow morning and you found a whole bunch of emails in your inbox and you read through them all and you realized every debt's paid off. Email one, car pay, no car payments. Email two, no mortgage payments. Email three, no student loans. Email four, no, like you, you owe nothing. Your Kohl's credit card paid off, right? Whatever, right? Just you owe, you, there's not a dime of debt against you, no record of debt against you at all. How many of you would say that would be good news tomorrow if that happened to me, right? Some of you are like, oh, yeah. if you're here and you're debt free, you're like, I'm already there. That is nothing compared to what Jesus has done. Nothing. On the cosmic eternal scale, that's precisely what the gospel is. So let's go back to what the phrase spiritual maturity is, in him, right? In him, according to Paul, means two things. It means alive and debt-free. We have that? In him means alive and debt-free. You've been made, you who are dead have been brought to life. You who had this crushing record of debt of sin that you could not pay has been canceled. It's a great transfer. And if you woke up tomorrow morning and you were financially debt-free, it wouldn't necessarily make you rich. That's also what the gospel says. That you, the death that was owed to you is transferred to Jesus, and the riches that are in him are transferred to you. It's the great transfer. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who was rich became poor so that we might become rich in him, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8. The great transfer, right? Death is owed to us, but it's transferred to Jesus. Life is in him, and that's transferred to us. This is the good news. This is what Paul says to the Colossians. Listen, there's a lot of winds of change blowing. There's a lot of ideas in the culture. There's a lot of perspectives out there. Don't be deceived. Don't be taken captive, he says, by all these thoughts, by all these additives. Stay focused on who you were, what Christ has done for you. In him, he says. God makes you alive. God cancels your debt. God sets you free. You owe nothing. This reminds me of that great hymn, It Is Well. Some of you know this hymn. Some of you don't. There's this great line in the hymn. We're going to sing it later. My sin Oh, the bliss of the glorious thought, he says. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Paul says, how did he set you free? How did he make you alive? He nailed your sin to the cross. You don't carry it. Paid in full. If you're in him. And there's one final act of the gospel here that he, he gives us in verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What does this mean? We could spend a number of sermons on this alone. He disarmed the rulers. The phrase there is very interesting. He's, Paul's drawing on the imagery of the ancient Greek and Ro Greco-Roman world. When a, when a general or military leader would, would triumph in battle, they would come into the city as a conquering hero. And in their train behind them would, would be bound up the captives. Leading the captive train would be the defeated general, defeated king. Think about the beautiful irony of this. The cross, which was intended by the enemy of God to be the death of God, Jesus, Jesus turns that up on its head and it becomes his triumph, their humiliation. He's humiliated them openly. When Paul uses the phrase rulers and authorities, he's not talking about politics and, and human rulers, although sometimes they're included. He's talking about spiritual forces. Demonic forces. Some of you might be thinking, oh, it's one of those churches. Look, C.S. Lewis said in the screw tape letters, there's two equal and opposite errors we should not make when it comes to believing in demons. One is to believe in them too much, like a devil behind every rock, and the other is to disbelieve in them entirely. He, our enemy is equally pleased with either error. But the Bible's clear. We do have an enemy. There, are, there is a spiritual battle. And what he says is, at the cross, Jesus not only made you alive, not only canceled your debt, not only set you free, he defeated the powers that are against you and against his church in the world. In other words, we fight against a defeated foe. In Ephesians 6, Paul will say, our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, same two Greek words, and principalities of this dark world. And the end is not in doubt. Think about World War II. When the Allies succeeded at, on D-Day by getting a beachhead at Normandy, 
for all intents and purposes, the war was over. And all, all, every historian will tell you this. I mean, it was a matter of time. When the Germans failed to stop them landing there and establishing a beachhead, it was a matter of time before the Allies would win. Yet, there were many, many thousands of lives still lost in the battles that followed. There was a lot of damage done by the Nazi party even as they retreated. There's a sense in which that's what Paul's saying here. In our time, it feels like, well, I don't know if God's winning. He's saying, don't, never forget, the end is not in doubt. The end is, the end is certain. Even though, right now in the moment, it might feel like there's a lot of damage being done. Jesus has disarmed them. He's conquered them. And he's the one that's in you. And you're in him. Okay. Oh, I can't be 1006. <laughs> oh, wait. The last section of the, of the text. I'll just read it and we'll make a couple comments. Paul says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by this sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So a lot of words there. Here's what Paul's saying. Therefore, if this is all true, that you were dead and God made you alive and he canceled your debt and forgave you and set you free and defeated the powers, if that's all true, then you need nothing else. Don't go back to dead religion or false spirituality. And there, we could spend a lot of time talking about what was going on in the Colossian church. But we've got them in our day as well. I would put it this way. Dead religion, I'll define it this way. Dead religion is rules and rituals to please God. False spirituality is exotic experiences to encounter God. You don't have to try to impress God with your religiosity because he's already given you all in Christ. You, you don't have to try and get God's attention or turn his heart toward you. He's already turned toward you in Christ, in him. You don't have to try to alleviate or, or assuage God's anger toward your sin because he's already paid that in Christ. And you don't have to try to encounter God with mystical experiences or new ideas or new philosophies. You encounter him in Christ. Remember, the whole thing holds together in that phrase, in him. If you wonder, well, how, how, how can I be sure that I'm not being led astray? I think the two things historically that are always true, false spirituality and dead religion, you know what it looks like? A focus on you. It's all about you. Or a focus on the exalted guru who has all the answers. Any idea, philosophy, spirituality, religious notion that, that diminishes Jesus and elevates you or anyone else, you should put that aside. That's not in him. Because this is what Paul says. You're not holding fast to the head. Jesus, the rule and authority, the one who everything holds together, he's the one that nourishes you and gives you a growth that is from God, he says. Spiritual maturity, growth, real growth, happens in Jesus, in him alone. What better way for us than to hold fast to him by coming to his table? What a perfect way to end, by reminding ourselves of who he is and what he's done. And this is why we say here at Chapel Street that it doesn't matter to us if you're a member, a regular tender, if it's your first time here, if you're in him. And if you're confused about that still, let me tell you what that means. That means you place your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the question I ask over there in the tank. Have you placed your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you surrendered to him? Then you're in him. And if that's true of you, then you're welcome at his table because it's his, not ours. We're going to pass the elements. You'll get two cups stacked together. Just hold them both in your hands. Once we've all been served those elements, I'll come back up and lead us through taking them together. Let's bow as the ushers come. Father God, this text is beyond my capacity to, to communicate. So we're trusting your spirit to speak. And it's beyond our comprehension, really. So we're trusting your spirit to quicken our hearts and make us new. Open us to what you want to say. Even if it's to remind us again that all we will ever need is found in you and in you alone. We thank you, Jesus, 
You hold all things together. Amen.